Hey guys, welcome to the Rubin Report. I'm still Dave Rubin. We've got writer and Buzzfeeder Lewis Peitzman with us, and comedian and Renaissance man John <laughs> Fugel sang with us. And let's get right to it. John Boehner. He's the Speaker of the House. He's a very, very tan man. And guess what? He is suing President Obama. That's right. He has had it with these executive actions that basically the Republicans have forced President Obama to take because they won't allow him uh, to get any legislation to his desk to sign. And now uh, they're saying he's overreaching. So uh, Boehner is actually forming a lawsuit to sue the president over this. And uh, President Obama is not too happy about it. And we've got some video. You know, uh, the, the suit is a stunt. It, but what I've told Speaker Boehner directly is if you're really concerned about me taking too many executive actions, why don't you try getting something done through Congress? The majority of American people want to see immigration reform done. We had a bipartisan bill through the Senate, and you're going to squawk if I try to fix some parts of it administratively that are within my authority while you are not doing it. Okay, so just to be very clear what's happening here, the Republicans are not giving him any legislation to sign, so he's trying to take uh, power with, which is within his right, even though I've talked a lot about how I'm not for the executive actions and I believe in separation of powers and all that, but they're pretty much giving him no choice. He seems pretty pissed there. For Obama, that's actually pretty pissed, don't you think? I agree, well, he's right that it's a stunt and it's got nothing to do with him. It's all about the fact that John Boehner knows how deeply the Tea Party hates him, and this is nothing more than a craven plea to the Tea Party to respect him by doing something disgusting. Uh, Obama has had significantly fewer uh, executive orders than President Bush, which never bothered anyone. Yeah, and you know, it's literally like twenty percent of yeah. what Bush oh, yeah. did. Yeah, and, you know, this is but this is Agent Orange's whole thing. He's got nothing going. He has no legislative agenda, no legislative agenda whatsoever. And this is why when they want to talk about Obama having a low approval rating, well, uh, Congress has a lower approval rating than chlamydia. <laughs> right <now. laughs> chlamydia is like at five. Chlamydia and Congress is pulling a is... solid fifteen. Yeah. And because uh, at least it's fun getting there, yeah. uh, as opposed to John Boehner. So this is all. Look, when when they were voting last year. Uh, on who the Speaker of the House should be, there were uh, several rather conspicuous protest votes against Speaker Boehner. Louis Gohmert actually voted for um, for what's his face, the lunatic, to, Ted Cruz. To, no, not Ted Cruz. The the uh, Alan West. Which lunatic? There's so Alan, many. Yes, Alan, Alan West. West. Yeah, Alan, yeah. Alan West is so in, his Thorazine flushed itself down the toilet. Yeah. That's how crazy. He is. <laughs> well, he's out of a but, job now. Yeah, so that's and he good. was out of a job then. Yeah. Louis Gohmert voted for a guy who had been voted out of Congress to be the Speaker of the House over Speaker Boehner. He knows how deep unpopular he is. The, his biggest ally was Eric Cantor, who wanted his job. This is John Boehner's desperation showing through, and it's not going to make the Tea Party yeah. like him anymore. And that really didn't work out for Eric Cantor. So before we get into too much of the political minutia of this, did you know that they could even sue the president? Doesn't this seem like the worst possible? Like, our government's so dysfunctional. And by the way, uh, you could sue the president. Well, here's what I'm, I'm seeing. I'm seeing Boehner being desperate. I'm seeing Obama being angry. And I feel like the best way to solve this is with reality television. I feel like <laughs> a Judge Judy type show mm -hmm. would, I would absolutely support a stunt like that if I could watch it play out on TV. Yeah, is what do we do about this? Because this is something we talk about every week on this, that just the branches of government no longer work, that Obama's being forced into this. They work this if and, you work it, not to sound like I'm in an AA room, but they work if you work it. it, it right, but w with the construct that we have now, just with the with the Republicans sort of being held hostage by the Tea Party, like it's just nothing's working. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to make this work instead of going to idiotic lawsuits and forcing the president's hand to do things that a lot of people don't want him to do and that kind of thing? Well, I mean, this is Obama's making it work. That's why he's doing this. The American people don't want to sit around and you know complain about the government. They want the government to do stuff for them. But it is in the interest of the GOP to make government as weak as possible. They serve the CEOs. The struggle in our country has never been conservative versus liberal. It's aristocracy versus democracy. And it is in the interest of the upper 1%, of the upper 0.01%'s evil half, yeah. to keep government from working. And I find it interesting, the same people who are trying to weaken government here are complaining that other countries view our government as weak. I love that line. I saw you tweeted it earlier. It's, uh, you it's know, a good it's one. It's exactly what they do. They want, th they're getting exactly what they want. They want the gridlock. They want nothing to happen. Because if government works, that means democracy works. And if democracy works, that means the people are going to run this country. And that is not in the interest of these vassals of the Koch brothers. So going to uh, your reality show point, should we have more cameras around what's <laughs> going on? Really? I yes. mean, remember, I just, do you remember during the Obamacare debate, even President Obama said, we will have this all open 
happened to everybody and we'll air it all on C-SPAN. Of course none of that happened. I don't, and I think the Democrats don't want it just as much as the Republicans don't want it. So really, shouldn't we have, not that it has to be a reality show where we're voting people off, although I think that's a pretty good idea, but shouldn't we have just more cameras around so some of this stuff is actually transparent? Or at least a really well-made Netflix documentary. I mean, that changed everyone's <laughs> mind on Romney. If that had come out before the election, things would have gone very differently. I thought that mid documentary was about an old baseball glove. And uh, well, that would have been more interesting, no, actually. You're, you're right, though. I, I, I think the Supreme Court should be on television. I think student, I think classrooms, I think public school classrooms should be on the internet. I think executions should be televised. We're paying for it. I will, if you televised executions, you'd see the, the, the numbers on death penalty flip overnight. So you think it would go down? I think people oh, yes, are so sadistic, it might actually if go these up. people who go to church and call themselves Christians, despite the fact that Jesus quite clearly spoke out against killing the sinner, he never mentioned birth control, never mentioned abortion, never mentioned gay people, did speak out about killing the sinner, rather specifically. If these people saw the murder that their tax dollars pay for, and by the way, I like that they don't consider it murder if the state does it. It doesn't get more big government than strapping a guy to a table and poisoning him to death. Right. And doing it in front of viewers, yes. Although sometimes the guy that's actually doing the poisoning or the electrocution or whatever, doesn't even know because they have them blindfolded. I think taxpayers have a right to see as much of what they pay for as possible that doesn't jeopardize national security. Yeah. All Let's right, also well, televise gay sex just so they know what they're missing out on. We do, that's the next step in the gay rights movement is televised gay sex. Sorry, John. You guys are looking at the wrong porn sites if you don't know <laughs> that's already out there. All right, well, you've given me a good segue here because let's talk about Jesus and the gays because Elton John has come out and said that Jesus would be down with the gays. That's right. Uh, we've got a little video from the interview. But do you ever think the church, I mean, the church, do you think it should allow its clergy, same-sex clergy, to get married? Of course. And, 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 and I don't see why Catholic priests have to be celibate. It's crazy. You know, they, these are old and stupid things. Um, and the church hierarchy might be you know, uh, up in arms about it, the traditionalists. But times have changed. We live in a different time. Change. If Jesus Christ was alive today, I cannot see him as the Christian person that he was and the great person that he was saying this could not happen. Um, he was all about love and compassion and forgiveness and trying to bring people together. And that is what the church should be about. Love and compassion and all that good stuff. Could that be what Jesus was really all about? Lewis? I, I would say so, yes. I would also say, I'm, I have to tell you, the thing that struck me most about this story was Elton John saying he wanted to have a small wedding. That was, that was like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not shocked by any of the Jesus comments. I was mostly shocked by him saying that he wanted to have a quiet, small wedding and not like a hologram of Jesus actually blessing the ceremony, which is what I would expect from him. <laughs> right. Um, That's actually really funny because, you know, he runs the big Oscar party uh, mm -hmm. here in West Hollywood after the Oscars, and it's huge and over the top and ridiculous. But I just, small yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with him, though, and I think that um, there are plenty of Christians who, who have the same comments, the same, the same points about Jesus' teachings and um, how those don't really match what we hear about from the re religious right on a regular basis. Yeah, so, John, this is your wheelhouse stuff. This is one of your favorite <laughs> Well, topics. you know, look. Look, I think Jesus would object to Elton John's set list in concert for the last 20 years. I mean, what's with the new stuff? I like the Leon Russell album, but do I have to wait three hours to get to your song? It's Good God. Uh, <laughs> well, of course he's right. I mean, he's wrong about one thing, that Jesus was a Christian person. Jesus lived and died a Jew. Yeah. Um, but uh, he's exactly right about it. Homophobia is an insult to God. There is no passage of the Bible. Yeah. Say this to your trolls watching. Yeah. There is no passage of the Bible you can use to justify any kind of LGBT discrimination. None of y'all follow Leviticus, and Romans isn't about gay people. Um, I, I know all the verses very well. There's nothing in the Bible to justify it. So he's exactly right about that. He's also right about the Catholic church and celibacy. Uh, the, Catholic, the first pope, St. Peter, was married, and all the priests and popes and bishops were married for over a thousand years. It wasn't until Pope Innocent II in 1139 AD made celibacy the law to keep priests and popes from leaving land and wealth to their children. So that law is not because sex was bad, not because Christ was a bachelor, but because the church was greedy, which means married priests are technically the conservative point of view. That's quite fascinating, actually. Yeah, it's all greed-based. So do you think the church in the long term actually kind of screwed itself with all this crazy sex stuff and the repression and the gay stuff that it worked for a while? For many hundreds of years, it worked. But now we're getting to the point where that stuff doesn't fly anymore, and it's actually turning people yeah. more against of, religion. Of course, and it always backfires. I mean, look at Italy. There was a country where, um, because of the Catholic Church being there, they had no contraception. They had very few teachings of any of that, and the abortion, the abortion rate skyrocketed. Yeah. Uh, the deaths from abortion were crazy because they had no teaching about yeah. how to have proper contraception. I mean, these things, the more draconian the laws are, the harder it is to kind of have a normal, uh, safe life with sex. Yeah. Mother Teresa opposed divorce. 
you know, and, and again, birth control, not in the Bible. This is the same, this rule is the same reason why uh, we have the laws of Leviticus. It's not about holiness, it's about keeping your tribe's numbers up. And they're becoming a third world religion, and they're going into the third world and saying, your poverty's a gift from God, you'll get your reward in heaven, you can't be devout unless you're pumping them out. <laughs> and the more poor people you have who are superstitious and ignorant and keep having and more babies, the more, the more size your flock has and the more you can fleece said flock. And it's back, it still works in the third world, it's backfiring it's, big time in the first world. Yeah, so, uh, And you none know, of it's biblically supported, none of it. Right, not that they really care what's biblically no, supported. It's about, it's about Obviously. the team. Do you think when Elton John says something like this, does any heart or mind get changed there? Because the people that are on yes. board, you, you think that actually affects some, so somebody that yes. you think is a believer, you think can actually hear that message. The burden's and, on them to explain why Christ would oppose same-sex marriage when he never said a thing against gay people. And I could bore you with you know passages that I think prove that Jesus had a pro-LGBT uh, attitude. Uh, the story of the Roman centurion who's, who's, please come to my house to heal my slave. And the apostles were so angry, but what do we know about the Romans historically? Uh, they brought their teenage boy <laughs> lovers on the road, and yeah. in the Greek, the word isn't slave, it's pais for beloved boy. So that explains why the apostles were so furious at Jesus that he, and why would a centurion of the, and again, I'm taking the story literally, it's, yeah. it, let's, that's how they want it. Why would a centurion of the Imperial European occupying army seek out a homeless local Jewish mystic faith healer to come into his home to heal a common slave? It explains why the apostles were so outraged because Jesus essentially blessed a gay union. Yeah. John's taking the highbrow stuff. Jesus had abs. That's proof he was down with the gays. <laughs> no? abs, yeah, man. let's go with the lowbrow. That was <laughs> and also, yeah, let's just do that. More reality television, more uh, fixation on Jesus' abs. <laughs> yeah. Jesus makes Buddha really insecure. <laughs> he totally does. Um, all right, so last thought on this. So, you know, this new pope has been kind of down with the gays, and he's been so, sort of. It's still you're getting a lot of repression, but a little bit. You both nodded at the same time. So, But, but basically, he kind of has said, let's get away from... He's talking the talk better than any other pope. I'm waiting for the walk to get walked. Yeah. I assume same thing. Yes, same thing. I mean, I think that um, it's easy to kind of be happy when he makes these statements that go viral on Facebook, but I don't know if he actually has, I mean, he hasn't carried through with any of these thoughts in any meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, All I, right. I love the guy and I hope he gets a really good food taster. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he will. Pope, can you, uh, can you like this on uh, YouTube, please? <laughs> Thanks. I saw Godfather 3, Dave. I know how this ends. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Facebook. Have you heard of this monstrosity, this giant company that is stealing all your data? You signed up for it though, so is that stealing? I'm not so sure. Well, you know what they're doing with your data? They are actually doing bizarre scientific tests uh, to depress you. Yeah, that's right, we've got some info. For one week in early 2012, Facebook changed the content mix in the news feed of about 700,000 users. Some were shown a higher number of positive posts while others were shown more negative posts. The study found that users were shown more negative content were slightly more likely to produce negative posts. Users in the positive group responded with more upbeat posts. Okay, so we all talk about this all the time, the data and that we just give this stuff away and we never read the terms of service and we click yes on everything. But now they're actually manipulating things to alter our mood. I'm pretty sure nobody signed up for that. Uh, I, I hate Facebook. I talk about it constantly Are on this show. Are you saying that negative things make people feel negatively? What kind of <laughs> freakish science monstrosity is this? <laughs> yes, it is crazy. The theory uh, that negative things make other negative things crazy. Um, How do you know if you're one of the subjects if you're already depressed all the time like me? Like, I don't understand. I, I, they probably would have left someone like you out of their algorithm. Well, I chose that to assume that I was part of the experiment because it just made me feel a lot better about my Facebook behavior. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm depressed by my distant cousins making me play Candy Crush Saga, so I don't really know how much worse it could get. <laughs> okay, so should anyone be upset by this, really, though? Because we sign up for these things. We don't, we don't read the terms of service, right? It's a 50-page thing that you just scroll down and click yes on. And then they're doing this to us, but it's a free service. So do we have any right even to be upset? We have a right to be upset that, that they showed us things that were depressing when we were using their free service uh, that we signed up for. We have a right to be upset, but do we have any recourse against them? No, it's, it's, it's their baby. Right, so some people are trying to get together and pull some kind of lawsuit, but I'm sure that's not gonna if go you, anywhere. If you go to a party voluntarily and the music bums you out, you're welcome to leave. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, I, this is true. I, I, most sites do these things, you know, where they have like two different versions for different users, and the, CNN does different headlines, for example, to see what people click on more. You know, they're all they're all testing us. Yeah. This is just probably giving you more of your high school friends having babies to depress you. <laughs> That's something that does really bum me out. But you know, it's my choice to be on Facebook and to for whatever reason, be friends with people I haven't seen in 12 years. Yeah, do you guys ever you know, find that the positive news actually depresses you more than the negative news? You know what I mean? Like, if they, there is some theory on this that if you keep seeing your friends doing all this cool stuff, like people just by Instagram, everyone's food looks better than it actually is, and you think everyone's eating better food than you. So do you ever get more depressed by the positive things that you see people doing than just the people who are suicidal and all well, that? Well, when it comes to Instagram, I, I'm really torn between pictures of other people's food and pictures of girls' feet on a beach in front of bodies of water. Uh, those, I, I, I'm sort of torn between those two polarities. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I believe it was uh, Nietzsche who said we hate it when our friends become successful. No, that was Morrissey, actually. <laughs> but, Close. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I, I mean, if it's positive news in the world, great. If yeah. it's positive news for my friends, uh, if they're friends that I love, it's great. If they're friends that I secretly hate, then you know, that's my problem, ain't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good theory. I like that. I feel like if Facebook just had more posts, hashtag blessed, <laughs> that I probably would be more homicidal by the end of the day. Yeah. Are, are you guys with me in the general thing? Like, I've just had it with Facebook. I, I just don't like anything that it's about. Now, I only have a fan page, so I'm not involved in, in all the minutia of what's going on with uh, the feed and everything. But just this connectedness is, I, I'm just completely over it. Are you guys I, I, no, I disagree. I love it. I, yeah? I love knowing the names of my cousin's hideous children. <laughs> uh, I love being able to get back in touch with the same guys who called me fag and threw gum in my hair in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, being able to do that and and but now you're really better hair than that. Being so. able to being able to get you know which Brat Pack member quizzes are you ten times a day has enriched me culture. No, I mean I, I like Facebook. I use Facebook as a promotional tool as a comedian. Yeah. You know I have a fan I have a fan page. I have I have the old profiles I used to have, and then I have a private page for my family where I just post baby pictures so my cousins don't think I'm a leftist monstrosity. <laughs> uh, so no, I get a lot. You, you get out of what you put into it, and um, I don't really get so sucked into it that I'm giving my you know information away to apps. And, and things like that. No Facebook apps, no Facebook hacks. It's science. So. There you go. So you're doing it in a very controlled kind of way. How, how do you manage well, for, your... First of all, check your Facebook fan page privilege, because not all of us have that option. <laughs> all right, some of us have to actually no, dude, interact trust me, with I people. Say, I say that with all due, like, <laughs> grossness, really. No, I, I mean, I, I love Facebook in the same way that I love Twitter. You know, it's a mixed bag, and I feel like it's yeah. a great promotional tool, and you, you use it as you need to use it and you block people willingly. I mean, I have a bunch of, I have this problem where a lot of old women follow me on Facebook. Right. We don't really know why, um, but they do yell at me and criticize my language. Yeah. And, well, um, you do, uh, you talk about the Golden Girls a lot. I so. do, we, don't, we still don't really know where they came from, but I do have a Facebook problem with harassment. Yeah. Um, and I just make a joke out of it because I feel like it's, uh, the best way to handle these I things. I find Facebook is much better with harassment than Twitter, though, because on Facebook, yes. you actually have to show your name and identity, and most people don't go to the trouble of putting together a, a, an alias, as they do on Twitter. On Twitter, these, these, these coward child men can come out and call you names, and yeah. yet they're protected by their own anonymity. That doesn't happen on Facebook. I have much. a policy, the Twitter policy, which is I won't fight with an egg. If you're just like <laughs> the Twitter egg, I will not. Well, you, yeah. you fight with them every no, morning. No, I don't fight. Or, you, or you'll I, retweet I some of them. The I, retweet, I retweet the really brilliant stuff, the really it, funny stuff, and the really uh, mean, dumb stuff. Yeah. And you know, ch uh, check, their, check their follower count, because if it's someone with 12 followers, you know, I used to see Keith Olbermann getting in these he, flame wars yeah. with these guys with these eggs with 12. I'm like, Keith, it's Twitter. There's girls here. What are you doing? What are you fighting like this? But I, honestly, I I, uh, I think that it can be very instructive, and I think that you can use those debates as a way of uh, letting someone else hang themselves creatively. Yeah. All right, so final thought on this. Is there anything that would get you to the point where you'd be willing to actually get off Facebook? It, like, So if, they, if you know they're doing experiments on you, is there any point with which it would just, uh, you know, the straw in the camel's back. I'm just gonna say no. I'm just gonna <laughs> be really honest about it. Yeah, you're staying. As long as I'm still promoting my, my stuff on Facebook, like, there's, it's gonna, I'm gonna stay. Yeah. Uh, could they do anything with all this information, even if you're hiding it to the best of your they ability? They could invest in Union Carbide. They could be pay yeah, they could be, you know, funding baby seal clubbing trips. I mean, there's lots of things that could be done that we're <laughs> Zuckerberg I would say, hates seals. I have to, oh, he hates them. <laughs> you know, lots of things that could be done where I would want to uh, where I'd want to withdraw my 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 membership. But I, I think that they're smart businessmen. They create a fun service. It is a great way to keep in touch with relatives without having to actually see them. And I think in that sense, uh, it's gonna be around for a long time. Yeah. All right, there you go. Let's talk about cupcakes. 
Cupcakes, they are the newest, hottest controversy. We always have a controversy about something that used to be okay. Now it is cupcakes. A Seattle school is banning cupcakes in elementary schools. Why are they doing it? Well, we've got some info for you. Uh, basically, they don't want kids to be fat. That's sort of the short of it. So they are allowing food can only be served at three classroom celebrations per year. Uh, the decision was based on nutritional factors and economics. It's not healthy for a cupcake party to be thrown for every student on their birthday, because if you're in a class of 30, that means you're having 30 cupcakes a year, <laughs> which is basically one cupcake every 10 days. I don't think it's that bad. Uh, and not all families can afford to send treats to school for a birthday celebration, leading some students to feel slightly left out. So I guess maybe that one has some validity. I think making some kind of ec economic argument sort of makes sense. But the idea that we're taking away these cupcakes, I know, I get it. The sugar we talk about. Yeah, these the reasons way, are all rubbish. Yeah, you're not on the, <laughs> I mean, I get it. I get all the stuff and we talk about high fructose corn syrup and all the horrible stuff we're eating and everyone's getting diabetes and all this stuff. I get all That's that. That's not the reason. Go. The reason is teachers' unions know better than anyone. You don't give rooms of 30 kids all this concentrated <laughs> sugar at one time and expect to do your job. It's hell. It's hell. Yeah. So that's really what's going on here. Yes, they want to control these kids. It's and screaming little imps. It's horrible. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's disgusting. They're all hopped up on crack. No, you can't. It says have the it. one father on the panel. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting that they said in the article. You know, they encourage parents to bring in other things like erasers, which is hilarious to me. And I guarantee, if I growing up had had a parent bring in something that wasn't edible, I would have found a way to eat it. I mean, I mean, the entire point of going to school is having birthday parties like right. once a week. And so. in fairness also, a lot of kids are born in summer, so it's not 30. Now, I was born on Labor Day, and my I'm, I'm a Virgo, uh, which means I'm a lot of work, but I'm worth it. And uh, <laughs> and, and the fact is that uh, when my first day of school in first grade was my birthday. And I told the teacher, it's my birthday, and she thought I was lying. I never got a cupcake party. It wasn't until months later she found out I had been telling the truth, and I had a retroactive one, and I, I, it was reparations. And yeah. that means a lot to me. Uh, but no, it, 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 there are other practical ways. You can give, bring in grapes, you know? Like you can do other things for a party. You can sing a song or do something special to, to not teach kids for 20 minutes. Right, so you're sort of down with the general idea this I'm really because of the sugar, the but don't idea, you but think it's you not be, it's, not, it's, not, it's not because of the nutritional factor. They're not afraid that one cupcake party or even 30 cupcake parties is gonna cause obesity. I'm more worried about what the kids are eating at home. Low income families can't afford a healthy meal. Uh, you know, I, I was in Mississippi making this film for PBS and, and you know, in so many communities, there's no grocery stores in rural America, and poor families get all their food from the dollar store or the gas station. Right, which is all processed. But and it's not. The, that's not. Yeah, that. that's not the school's responsibility. This is all about sugar and hopped up little crankheads. Okay, so if it is about that, don't you still think you lose something by not having that? Like, if I think back to my elementary school days. Those were great, like they'd, somebody would come in with the cupcakes, everybody, like you lose something if we don't let kids celebrate the way kids, guess what, there's sugar when they're adults too. So I get it, you're trying to set some the sort teachers of, don't have to deal with that. Right, so I get it, but don't you think they're losing something? Like you're just losing something about growing up if you can't eat freaking cupcakes in school? Yes. Defend the cupcakes, kids, please. Well, no, kids will find a way to eat cupcakes anyway. I mean, I'm not saying, I guess that's a, that's a terrible argument because that's kind of what people who are against gun control say, but I, I just feel like Cupcakes are gonna happen regardless. Maybe have one party a month for everyone born in that month, and you have a, a condensed cupcake, mm -hmm. and you can have it at uh, you know at 3 p.m. instead of having it in the middle of the day. I'm just looking at solutions here so we don't have to stop eating cupcakes. Right, so you want the cupcakes. The teachers union would say, you know what, give them a cupcake as they're leaving school. Well, here, I get say, out of here and, and take and, you a know, cupcake. I'm happy to see one small, tiny victory for a teachers union somewhere yep. in America, but I think a very practical solution is uh, the end of every month, you, have, you take one hour at the end of every month and have your cupcake party for all the kids who had a birthday that month. Uh, that way the poor kids aren't singled out for more shaming if they can't bring in cupcakes. You just do it for every kid who had a birthday in March. We're doing it, and we're doing it in the 30 minutes before we put you on the bus home. <laughs> <laughs> right, that doesn't bode well for the bus drivers. No, it doesn't. Or then they have a very powerful union too. But parents um, can do, the parents can deal with the sugar high and exactly. at home. Right, they can just lock them in the basement and do what they want with them. Do you guys think we're, we're gonna ever have like a bounce back against this health conscious thing that we have going on right now? Because we are talking about it so much that I do fear that we're gonna have this weird thing where suddenly everyone's gonna wanna eat awful stuff Wait, you all fear the time. it? I feel like that's actually that's the best the possible norm. scenario is that we well, actually jump back to fast I, food. Yeah, you th you'd be happy. No, I mean, I, obviously that's a, that's a problem too, but I, I feel like we, we might be a little too stringent at times. I don't know, I'm not raising a child, I'm also, um, making my own poor dietary choices for myself, so I don't know. Um, but isn't what it's it isn't like it like the gun kids. thing as you just said? Like it's 
to me, so you know, every time there's a shooting, somehow the gun sales go up. Yes. And I think that's partly what's happening here. We keep telling people to eat well, and then everything shows that they're eating worse. Is there some weird? What is it with the humans? only way to stop a bad man with a cupcake is <laughs> a good man with a cupcake? That's it's amazing what an equalizer type two diabetes can be. You know, and I think unfortunately it's going to. You know, it, for me as a child, it took sitting next to my grandfather with lung cancer, holding his hand when he died, for me to know I was never going to eat cig take cigarettes. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of kids are going to have to see the suffering of their parents and grandparents from having an unhealthy lifestyle to really realize it. And even then, they might not, because food's a drug, and comfort food is a really nice way of uh, of phrasing something. But what it really is is unhealthy habits, and it's not about changing diet; it's about changing habits, and that's a lot harder. Yeah. That's why we talk about this on the show because we're trying to get a little a little information across. I, of course, am going to still eat cupcakes openly and freely. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are about 3.6 million people who are at or below the minimum wage. They're working at or below the minimum wage. Uh, and Upworthy created a couple graphs on this that I thought were pretty interesting. So let's take a look. Okay, so who works at the minimum wage? Teenage boys, 10%, I think that makes sense. You get your first job, you're cutting grass, you know, doing uh, other newspapers. There's still newspaper boys, that's what I did. Uh, adult women, this one's crazy. At minimum wage, almost half of those people are women, uh, adult women. Teenage girls, 14%. Adult men, 27.5%. Uh, now here's the fascinating part. So 34% of these people who are at minimum wage have some college or an associate's degree. That seems incredibly high. 7% have a bachelor's degree or higher. 28% uh, less than high school, so that I think makes some sense. And 31% uh, uh, are high school graduates. So there's, there's some interesting numbers here. Some I think kind of surprising and some not too surprising. But the, the education one is the scary one to me. I mean, the people that are going to college and still working uh, minimum wage, th this is a scary number, right? Yeah, I mean, stay in school, you can end up working a minimum wage job. It's not the best encouragement. <laughs> right, that's not, that's not helping. No. The scariest yeah. number, uh, which wasn't listed on those graphs, is that I believe it's 56% of minimum wage earners are full-time workers, and more than half of minimum wage earners uh, provide uh, most of the income for their households. Yeah. We have to decide if we're gonna live in a society where a person can work full time and still live below the poverty line. But these graphs you show are very valuable because one of the most insidious arguments against raising the minimum wage, which a decent society would do, uh, it's the least we could do after destroying unions, which built the middle class, is that uh, they're all kids doing summer jobs, they're starter jobs, and that's not and the case. And it's simply not the case. No. So I assume both of you guys are on board this Seattle idea of the $15 minimum wage. Is I thought we were going back to cupcakes. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that. Sure, let's Adjusted go with that. You want to pay people in cupcakes going back to our earlier season. Well, yeah. But yeah. I mean, that's a separate issue. The yeah. week we're taping this, of course, is the week that, LA, uh, that California just raised their minimum wage from $8 to nine. San Francisco, it's 10.74 an hour. And if you adjust for productivity uh, and inflation, the minimum wage today should be $21 an hour. Now, Australia raised theirs to $16 an hour and unemployment went down. Right. It's gone up since then because of mining uh, closers. But uh, all the same doomsday predictions were made and they were all proven false. Every time they've ever tried to raise the minimum wage, going back to Henry Ford, instituting the $5 a day wage for his workers uh, on, the, on the line at the Ford factory, and they've all said this will crush the economy, kill jobs. It's never true because if your employees have more money, they are spending more money in your community and it drives the economy. The middle class are the job creators. And if we're all gonna be low wage slaves, eventually there will not be high enough walls for the 1% in their gated communities. Yeah, you know, we did a story in December about literally at Walmart, because they pay their employees so poorly, they were taking donations at Walmart for their own employees, for Which Christmas you must gifts. Do. Well, that's the thing with Walmart, is its price is so nice you pay for them twice. Uh, you know, Because then are, they get subsidized. There are some stores where up to 80% of Walmart workers are on SNAP or some kind of public assistance. So you're paying for those low prices when you're there buying your non-American made crap, and you're paying for it again every April, uh, when you're paying your taxes and subsidizing. And the, the 16 heirs of the Walmart fortune control as much wealth as the bottom 40 million of Americans. Uh, that's disgusting, and it's not conservative, and it's not sustainable 
and it's not sane. Yeah, so when we hear all those numbers, what, what are we supposed to do? Because it's not changing. This is all getting worse. What, what do you think we can do, actually, to, to change the trend? You're asking for an actual solution. Like some kind of solution, <laughs> yeah. I mean, John brought a lot of logic into the argument, yeah. which I feel like is, is rare. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think raising the minimum wage makes absolute sense. I mean, it, you have facts and figures to back that up with, which is, you know, always a, a plus. I just made a movie about it, so. Um, yeah. that's, not, that's unfair, you came prepared. Um, yeah, I mean, is there really a question about this that I think we're all in agreement here. Yeah, why do you think women make so much less than men still? You know, even in the White House. Because they don't listen! <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but even in the White House, this week they showed that the average man that's working in the White House right now, I think makes $87,000 per year, and the average woman is making about $77,000. Now I get it, There's people have different jobs, and there might be some reason, but why even now is it still women are making less? It's almost like there's like a disparity between what men make and what women make on a broader scale. So it's not just the White House? I would say it's not just the White House, no. Yeah. I would say it's a national problem. Am I being women, unfair to the White House, John? No, women make less because that's what everyone's agreed to. Yeah. And when everyone stops agreeing with it, it'll change. Yeah. But you know, you want a real solution, get money out of politics. I'm with Secretary <laughs> Reich on this. It's the only way you're gonna start it. Find a way to get money out of politics. Look, I'm not a liberal, I'm an Eisenhower Republican. Okay, and why was the middle class so strong in the 1950s? Everything Republicans hate now. Strong union involvement. Do yourself a favor and look at some 1956 Eisenhower re-election posters. It's all about Republican support unions. When people have more buying power, you have a stronger middle class and the rich do better too. Infrastructure spending, like the interstate highway plan. Uh, uh, socialism, like the GI Bill, and a more progressive taxation rate. The rich have never paid lower taxes in, in 70 years than today. This is all fixable. Man-made policies got us into this income inequality mess, and man-made policies can get us out of it. Oh, so it's not Jesus that's gonna get us out? <laughs> <laughs> Look, if we had a government based on Christian values, uh, we'd be kind to the poor, kind to the sick, kind to prisoners, and not start wars. Yeah, there you go. Well, pretty much everything we ever do on this show, and everything you're seeing in the news constantly, all is about about money in politics. So actually, go check out wolf-pack.com. All right, one more for you. Uh, the New York Times has put together a composite ranking uh, of where Americans are healthy and wealthy or where they're struggling, and uh, let's take a look at the graph. Okay, so the Times came to this conclusion by looking at six data points for each county in the United States, and they included uh, education, median household income, unemployment rate, disability rate, life expectancy, and obesity. All right, so uh, where are you doing worse? The more red or the more orange it gets uh, are the places you're doing worse. So a lot, the South, not doing that well. Uh, mm -hmm. The tiny orange dot by New York City, I don't know if you can see it over there, is the Bronx, so not doing that well in the Bronx. Uh, Northern California, I was surprised, not doing as well as I would have thought. Now we're in SoCal over here and we're doing okay. Uh, but again, the South is by far the worst. The Midwest seems to be okay. Uh, Florida, I thought was kind of interesting because the beaches all are in good shape. But if you're in the middle of Florida, uh, you're not doing too well. Is there anything? Well, the middle of Florida be, will be the beaches in 100 years. Yeah, it's so. Actually, Miami, by the time we finish this show, could be <laughs> Miami uh, completely, be, completely <laughs> underwater. Miami will be a coral reef by the time we finish this show. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so, you notice it right there that it's, yeah. it's the highest concentration of doing worse right in the heart of the voting against our own interest belt. Okay, you so know, that's, there's a reason Alabama went for Romney, and you're looking at it right now. Yeah, so what's going on in that in that orange area? Lewis, can you gain, can you I'm colorblind, so I actually can't see this map at all. <laughs> it's just blue and orange. Well, just um, trust me, uh, it's not doing too well in the South, basically. No, I thought the criteria was really interesting. I, I was interested that they included obesity um, in there, mm -hmm. uh, and it was unemployment, obesity, and I forget what else was in there. Um, but it seemed very subjective. I'm always thinking about these things in terms of like, my life because I'm a selfish, self-involved person. So I was just thinking that like in Los Angeles, being obese is a lot harder than I feel yeah. like it is in, in some of those um, blue places in the Midwest. Right. I'm just saying, no, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Do you think there's a connection uh, between happiness and gay marriage? Because apparently by that map, it looks like there's some connection. The places where gays are okay, there's something. What there's do you mean something. by okay? I mean, there's lots of states where where marriage equality has come about because of activism by a, a morally awakened populace, and other states where a judge has just said no, and whether you like it or not. So yeah. I, I don't I don't think it's. You mean those crazy activist judges who well, are yeah. always radically doing things that if are. If you help people, you're an activist judge. If you help corporations, you're a strict constitutionalist. You got to learn <laughs> exactly. this. But uh, I, I do think that that um, in many cases, yeah, that you know, in a more progressive place where you have. If you if the people have brought about marriage equality, the same people have probably brought about a higher wage, uh, less income inequality, 
and therefore more happiness. It's why Denmark is much happier than we are and why the American dream really should be called the Scandinavian dream because they enjoy a much higher standard of living, uh, less income inequality, and uh, you know, no one goes bankrupt ever trying to pay for health care. But aren't they not as free as us? Isn't that? They're more free than us. I know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Because that's, I know. Uh, yeah. Um, so what, wait, let's just throw the graph up for one second because there was one that I thought was particularly interesting there. Wyoming, they're pretty happy in Wyoming. There's, uh, There's 17 of them. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all so doing, is that they're what doing it is? really well. So Wyoming, hopefully, if you, uh, if you need to look at a map while you're looking at this to figure out Wyoming, you, it's, it's sorted to see in this, the middle upper. I'd love to see what North Dakota looks like in five years because the fracking economy is gonna change the entire economic makeup of the whole state. And you can go to a place that was a one-stop sign town a year ago and make six figures now driving a truck up there. And fracking will change the entire economy of North Dakota. Right, so you'll make a lot of money through fracking, but your water might be exploding. Uh, yes. That yes. could be a problem. So if, you're, if your water explodes in your face, even if you're in a big fancy house, you probably wouldn't be too happy. You would right? be doing worse. <laughs> you're doing water catches fire, you're doing, you're doing right. worse. So it might suddenly get better, and then when the exploding water comes, then it'll get worse. I mean, there are so many other factors to, to, to factor into this. I mean, it was, it was a very, it's, it's very interesting. It's just, I don't think it's a complete picture yeah. by any means. So yeah. Wyoming, that's why I think Wyoming's the interesting one, because there are so few people there, yet... They seem, ha so is that partly it? They've they're, got they're a lot of land. Liz Cheney's dropped out of the race okay, against Enzi, so that's why happiness has gone up there. They're not gonna have Liz Cheney as their senator. I can't think of a possibly more perfect way to end it. John Lewis, thank you guys. Their Twitterers are right down below, and we will do this again next week. Don't forget to comment, like, YouTube, that Facebook thing, I love that thing, so post it on <laughs> there. Uh, Twitter, Instagram. Pinterest. I love your show, Dave. It's a great show. I love having you guys on. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do it again next week. Thanks, guys.